to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal, and we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and atheist. Jeff? Hello. And me, Benjamin DeCampos, a designer and believer in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, then we publish the notes, which are available to read along on our website, eclecticist.co.uk. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is American conservatism. American conservatism. Avoiding godless communism. This is done by promoting prayer in school, believing climate change is a hoax, opposing abortion, supporting American exceptionalism, and generally only caring about one's own needs. Screw everyone else. It's all about me. Perhaps American conservatism is actually a personality disorder, like sociopathy. And how can we so reliably predict what a person's stance on climate change is by knowing where they stand on same-sex marriage? Isn't this tribe mentality? How far have we regressed? And since when was Jesus a conservative, for Christ's sake? So what do you understand by American conservatism? What does it actually mean? I'm not entirely sure. I just have noticed that it's something very divisive. It's like a being a conservative. Conservative itself is like a dirty word. And I'm just interested to know more about it. There are certainly differences between what a conservative is in the UK compared to what a conservative is in the US, I think. I mean, maybe you can talk about that. I'm not sure. But it just seems to me, sort of casually hearing some chatter here and there and um, some infamous uh, sort of debates that have happened and a few notorious individuals, that if you're an American conservative, you seem to be a kind of a-hole. And I want to see if I'm right about that or whether or not there's a problem on my end. There's certainly a kind of media bias against conservatism generally. It's like... I can't think of any younger generation famous person like an actor who is an American conservative, uh, who is a a conservative. No, no. He was an actor? Um, Yeah, I'm talking about sort of in the current era. It seems like everyone is not a conservative because if they are, that will harm their career is the feeling I get. And the only people in the public eye who aren't politicians that claim to be conservatives are older generation actors um, like uh, John Voight, um, Clint Eastwood, and people like that. And I noticed that they're starting to be maligned. It's like that sort of conservative tag is marginalizing them. And the general chatter that I hear in my circles are that those people aren't to be respected anymore. And this is confusing. It's like, so what is this? What, are the, what is this great big divide? And this is kind of what I want to explore here. Yes. What is, what is the divide? I mean, I have to admit, I really hadn't heard of the term American conservatism. Right. I mean, it's conservatism, but in, in America, I suppose. But it seems to have, I mean, certainly from the media, it has, it's a pejorative <laughs> because it seems as though the American media is almost entirely um, democratic in outlook. Uh, they're they're you know quite center left if not fully left. Who is sorry? Uh, the media in general in the United States. Okay, it's just incredible how left wing to my to my eyes seeming they are. So well, apart from a few notorious uh, exceptions to that, like your Fox News, yeah, and, they're, they're, uh, they're Breitbart a of, and a couple of others. But yeah, generally speaking, yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, Breitbart is interesting. We'll probably talk about that a little bit later on. So this, you know, they at the vanguard of the so-called alt right, which uh, oh, that's something fully, else. Fully understand? Yeah, that's something um, weird. So uh, there's a definition here, and I think this is from Wikipedia, which is quite helpful. Um, American conservatism is a broad system of political beliefs in the United States, hence American, uh, that is characterized by respect for American traditions whatever they may be, 
support for Judeo-Christian values, it's a Christian nation, economic liberalism, anti-communism, advocacy of American exceptionalism, and a defense of Western culture from perceived threats posed by creeping socialism, moral relativism, multiculturalism, and liberal internationalism. I should say also in Wikipedia, for each of those things, like American traditions, I think that's probably hyperlinked to another Wikipedia page, which will then go into more detail. No, no doubt. No doubt. But um, yeah, I think that's a fairly good summary. But I kind of had to think about what are the things that most people that don't know about American conservatism pluck from thin air if they want to describe them. And it's people who don't want to pay taxes, who are against abortion (laughs) for any circumstance. That's not strictly true, but I've heard a few people say that. Um, And that's basically a a biblical thing, which we'll get onto. Judo-Christianity and all of that, all everything that that brings. And anyone who opposes these things, or anyone with a liberal leaning, and we can talk about what that means, are communists, or fascists, or just something poisonous. And it's that Godwin's Law thing as well. It's like if you start talking about anything that might sound like socialism, people will say, well, that will just lead to gas chambers. Yes. Um, Yeah, I think... uh it seems to me, being on the other side of the pond, that Americans, especially young Americans, seem to synonymize American conservatism with far-right conservatism. Right. So if you were to describe yourselves, to self-identify as an American conservative, others may see you as some sort of right-wing, hyper-religious, homophobic um, crackpot. And I think that's terrible. I mean, that's a, that's a terrible slander on what American conservatism values actually appear to be. And I think re- reading that that little description, I, I sort of think, you know, all of those are defendable, I think, as subtopics. I think, you know, there's something to be said for patriotism and American traditions and maintaining American traditions and and being conservative in approach. That is to say, if some person pops along and takes a seat of power and suddenly says, hey, let's radically shift the social enterprise towards this direction. A conservative will say, whoa there, let's pump the brakes on that one. Let's not make any massive social engineering changes uh, because every time that's ever been attempted, it's been a complete disaster. So conservatives are slowly, slowly, gently, gently, don't take my freedoms away. Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything you said. And I certainly can imagine taking one or two things from that um, Wikipedia description and running with it. But the problem I have, and the thing I'm confused about, is how it's such a kind of package deal. And this is what I said in the intro about how someone's stance on climate change will weirdly dictate what they think about same-sex marriage. And so I don't understand that. Oh, I don't believe that. What evidence do you have for that? It's definitely true. And so I've been listening to talks and, you know, media appearances by, again, a few of these notorious individuals like Ann Coulter, Dennis Prager, Sean Hannity, and there's a whole bunch of other a-holes as well. And they're all that. They all think climate change is a hoax. You know, they all bring out their pseudoscience. And Bill O'Reilly as well. He's another one. They all trot out this... this, um, pseudoscience to back up their claims that climate change is a hoax. I don't know. There's like a kind of checklist of are you an a-hole, and they generally take every single one of them. Now, doesn't that sound unfair? But that's the impression I get. Yeah, I I can see how you could cultivate that impression, but I don't necessarily think it's even largely true across the board. Um, I mean, I'm I'm sympathetic with a lot of these seemingly Looney Tune um, stances on hot topics like climate change. I mean, I don't think climate change... Well, first of all, I fully accept climate change because, of course, climate changes. That's what climate right. does. Climate is change, right? That's ridiculous. To say global warming, which is less a, a term that you hear as often, it, it, I think global warming has morphed into climate change. It used to be all. It used to be global warming all the time, but now it's climate change, and of course you have to accept climate change because that's what climate does. The, the, the key point is, do you think it's man-made? 
Well, that's interesting because where my sympathies lie is when this is put to advocates of man-made climate change. That is to say, if someone were to question whether or not there's enough evidence to suggest that it is down to our interference of the environment that we're having a general rise in temperatures, you're shouted at. You know, you're literally screamed at in your face. You know, you're attacked for even suggesting that maybe, you know, it, it's not 100% concrete that this is the case. And that worries me. Instantly, little red flags pop up in my mind. When Sh- people shouted are at by who? So, by, by everybody who supports climate change. It's like if you were to suggest that, you know, maybe the evidence isn't completely convincing or not particularly, not all there... The advocates go mental. They'll call you names. They'll, you'll, right. you'll be discredited. You know, you'll lose tenure. It, it's the response is so acidic and instantaneous that I immediately think, you know, where, where is the bigotry? Where, where is it? It's the people who cannot countenance any kind of criticism of this absolute fact that it's pumping, uh, you know, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's causing all of our woe and that worries me you know why people go puce in the face though it's because the climate change advocates um, believe that there is mountains of evidence that support that climate change is man-made and there just is and there just is that's what we hear we see there just is now me as the every man in the street i just have to sort of take that at face value i mean i can't sift through the evidence but it does remind me of the kind of arguments that was brought up, brought out by the tobacco lobbies when scientists started saying that smoking can kill you. They were, they were forever trying to plant um, doubt, you know, the seeds of doubt in you know, the every man's mind. And I can't help but think that that's what's happening here. And you just dig a little deeper to find out what the motives are for denying climate change. And it's normally um, for reasons of... American exceptionalism, um, all the other things that fall into the conservatism category. And while we're on that subject, I found this brilliant quote. I don't know anything about this man, but I really like it. Upton Sinclair, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And I can't help but think that there's a lot of instances of that where you have the conservatives railing against the so-called science of climate change. Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 sort of a um, a contention on two levels. There's is the changes in temperature that we're witnessing, which are certainly happening, you know, as far as our sampling is concerned, is that wholly attributed to our increase in CO two emissions, or is it partly, or is it even a bad thing? If the you know the the concentration of co2 is increasing in the atmosphere um yeah you know isn't that a good thing or isn't it far more worrying to have an ice age and to have global cooling isn't that much more of a threat than to raise the temperature you know by a few degrees yes okay some low lying land masses may become overwhelmed by the oceans uh you know but overall Living on a warmer planet versus with a lot of CO2 that can feed all of the vegetation, which is, you know, ultimately at the bottom of the food pyramid versus total ice death where everything dies. Which one would you choose? And I'm thinking, you know, perhaps we're doing a good job in pumping CO2 into the atmosphere because we're offsetting this rhythmic ice age that, you know, is pretty much due any time now. So, <laughs> you know, great. Yay, yay, more carbon dioxide. So, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm partly joking there. I think uh, any kind of upset or sudden upset in our seemingly incredibly fragile atmosphere uh, sounds like a bad thing to me. You know, nobody wants massive tsunamis and deaths in the millions due to things that we potentially could avert. So it's certainly a scientific and engineering consideration on exactly how we're managing this planet. Uh, There are a lot of humans, and we have industrialized at an incredible rate over a very short period of time. To my mind, you know, it seems 
obvious that we would have an effect on the climate, whether it's a good effect or a bad effect. Uh, you know, maybe that's where the controversy lies. But it's just the vociferous um, rejection of any kind of questioning of the accumulated evidence that worries me a little bit. And I think it's lockstep, you know, with all the rest of the the drones is the danger and that we just accept and not question. And I think this is another enlightenment value, which I think is incorporated into American conservatism that is being shuttered. You know, the, the freedom of inquiry is being limited, you know, as well as freedom of speech and general freedom, I think, which uh, is under threat when we have these large government edifices, uh, embodied by the uh, the democratic way of thinking. Um, after reading that Wikipedia bit of uh, introductory blurb, which I thought was very good, I sort of tried to have take my take on American conservatism is this individualism versus collectivism, personal accountability, defense and celebration of hard won traditions, the rule of law, moral absolutism, and freedom to choose one's own path to happiness. So in my sympathies with American conservatism as I see it, I think what appeals to me is this sense of individualism, the sense of personal destiny and control of one's own destiny, rather than having to be anonymously subsumed into a common-for-all good centrally managed by some massive bureaucracy. What was that word? <laughs> Socialism. Colin Farrell? Colin Farrell, yes. I think <laughs> Colin Farrell, it's important for him to be able to determine his own you know, path towards happiness. And if he's locked down by some kind of uh, regime of uh, social control, I think that's a terrible thing. And, what, was and the, what was the word you used? I've completely forgotten what it was. Oh, okay. Listeners can Colin rewind. Farrell or something like that. Uh, but uh, I, you know, Trump, for instance, who I suppose you would see as an American conservative, one thing that I've, one impression that I've gotten from his campaign is how important it is to have laws <laughs> and the rule of law. And American exceptionalism shouldn't be accepting the law. It should be exceptionalism under the rule of law, because laws are important. So it's not fair to have one law for one person and another law for another person. So that that seems to be what you could be getting with the, the democratic thought process. Whereas in the American Constitution, you know, we're all Americans are the same, and they should be dealt with under the eyes of the aegis of the laws, the same. So, for instance, if the Islamic Sharia law were to be instituted in America, then it is completely incompatible with the Constitution, which uh, states that the law is the same for everyone, whereas that is certainly not the case with Sharia. So I think defending the Constitution, defending the Republic, defending traditions, uh, it's important. It's important to maintain traditions. And it's, uh, you know, if you're going to try and change traditions, that simply must be a slow, well thought through process, which gets the maximum um, agreement. You know, you really want to want to have as many people agreeing with whatever it is you're trying to do as possible when you change traditions. Yeah, but I got a couple little problems with that. Um for a start, the religiosity aspect, you know, American tradition includes support for Judeo-Christian values. That ain't in the Constitution. And I was listening to some guy on a YouTube video explain to me what American conservatism is. And he was listing things that didn't sound too unreasonable. But then when he says things like support for faith-based initiatives, and then he carried on listing other things. It's like, whoa, 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 back up there a little bit. That is just so infinitely elastic and the lack of wisdom in the bible for example raises a red flag i'd say and also just about trump being conservative i actually think that he's despite being a bumbling homunculus homunculus who's 
shockingly unqualified to hold office. He's actually shaking up I don't, I don't up get the whole... that unqualified jibe. How is he unqualified? Because you said yourself he's a private citizen. He's got no experience in Yeah, any but he position. has exper- he has experience of creating jobs. He has an experience For of Mexicans. international <laughs> contracts. Uh, you know, he 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 makes deals. Okay. He's good at making deals. That makes okay. him far more qualified than Hillary was when she joined. Yeah, but his history of making deals just sounds like such a throwback to a time that we really don't want to revisit. It sounds like the kind of sly, winking, greasy handshake deals that were done on a golf course that we're all trying to get away from. I think that's government as it is now. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't we want to change that? So the people that want to change things up by voting for Trump, they're actually, what they're doing is they're um, more of the changing, same. Yeah, more of the same. But um, just a slight digression there about Trump. I actually don't think that he um, is all that down with uh, Judeo-Christianity. So he's slightly... I think he professes to be a Christian. I think he, he does. actually does go to church. Do you think? Occasionally. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Well, Sam Harris brought up this uh, thing where the only time that he was put on the spot about religion, where he he said Corinthians 2 instead of 2 Corinthians. Now, I don't know this, but apparently saying Corinthians 2 is not something a Bible reader or believer would ever say. No, I don't, I don't know about that. But yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say he's not, he's not pious or particularly... You know, I don't get the impression that he's particularly religious. The word conservative comes from conserve, as in keep the tried and true. And I was just flagging up there about Judeo-Christian values, as if that's like an American tradition. And throwing it back to the Constitution doesn't help that argument, because there's nothing in there about it. Well, I think it is a Christian country. And I think Christian values are incredibly important in the country. And I think there's a lot to be said for Christian values. I think it's they're strong values and they're good values. What, what, what like? even, even without the you know the woo, I think you know strong fa- family bonds, charity, um, compassion. Ah, uh, now okay, Jeff. I have to pick this apart one by one. This is because th- this guy in this list of poster boys, Dennis Prager, he talks about this is something that he said in his talk. He goes, "There's more wisdom in the Bible." than there is in the New York Times. There's more wisdom in the Bible than there is in the LA Times. He was just listing newspapers. And I think that needs some explanation to say something like that. I mean, this is that whole cherry-picking argument. If you cherry-pick, then you could probably find a couple of things that might have some wisdom in there. But there's a lot that really doesn't. And I know this is an age-old argument of the new atheist era, but I think that that's a strange one. So I, I'd be interested to hear what you think the good moral points are to be had in the Bible. And just another Dennis Prager thing. You said there about compassion is a good thing, which I agree. But a compassion is, is what I don't think conservatives have. And I said in the intro about probably being a personality disorder, that they're almost autistic in their disregard for other people. And Dennis Prager started off this talk by saying... He wanted to challenge the insults hurled at conservatives by saying things like, conservatives are mean. Conservatives are mean. That's what you've heard. Conservatives are mean. So I thought, oh, great. He's going to challenge my thinking on that. And then, like, the punchline to what he was saying is, it's undignified to give somebody something for nothing. It's undignified. To me, that sounds like you're being mean. Giving somebody something for nothing. Yeah, so his, the whole punchline, what he was saying, was that, you know, he hates the idea of social safety nets and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And all of that, he goes into great detail. And he surmises everything by saying, to, to give someone something for nothing is just undignified. Meaning, I ain't going to do it. Um, I think I understand where he's coming from. But I wouldn't say giving something for nothing. I I don't see an issue with giving somebody something for nothing. Rather, having something taken from you to be given to somebody else. I can see the American conservative opinions against that. So that's, that's an anathema to conservatism, to be forced to give somebody else something. That flies in the face of any kind of voluntary action. So despite whether or not... He didn't say it like that, though. No, what he's saying I sort of don't agree with, which is, and and maybe it's a little bit deeper and more profound what he's saying, in that it's wrong and undignified to 
give somebody for nothing. Give something to someone for nothing. Because if something is unearned, there's no dignity in that, I think could be his argument. Which, you know, I, I kind of I kind of get that. I can understand it. that. It sort of makes sense. And I think conservatism is where you empower people. You know, you teach a man to fish yes. rather than just give him a whole bunch of free fish that you've stolen from somebody else. So <laughs> I think that is an overall more attractive feature. So if you build up this social safety net, as you say, um, by taking from people and giving to other people, well, then rather than having done that in the first place, what if you don't take anything from people? What would happen? Would the people who are in need just die or would there be a sense of charity? Because the sense of charity might be easier to express if you're not having your soul ripped out in taxes. So if you have a more voluntary, more charity-based social safety net versus, you know, gunpoint extortion through taxes, I think people would feel better and they'd more more likely give and there wouldn't be the resentment because you know if you have something taken away from you to give to somebody else even though it might benefit somebody else and might benefit society in general you still resent it especially if that money is not being used properly and not only do you resent the mechanism but you resent those who apply the force to take what you have and that's the government so you resent the government and in order to have all of this taxation framework you know you need a big government and that's again anathema to the american conservative outlook to american conservatives the government is to uphold contracts contracts are key they are key to civilization so for instance um a couple of weeks ago there is a chap who had a golden parachute from some failing business and his final payment damaged the business almost irrevocably and so he was seen as a sort of demon figure and there were calls to have his remuneration removed uh you know it's like 10 million pounds or something and you know he was just a terrible person and the media just saw you know he's a mansion owning you know uh plutocrat and uh you know he's the horrible evil face of capitalism but you know <laughs> that that's the knee jerk feelings from the left but from the right the way you see that transaction was that man was hired by that company to achieve a set of goals. He took a gamble, a personal risk. He said, I believe in myself and I can help you achieve those goals. But if I achieve those goals, you will pay me. A deal was struck and a contract was written. At the end of that contract, he said, I ab achieved the objectives. You must pay me. And the business said, Yes, we must pay you. Because if they didn't pay him, what worth do contracts have? You'll start to see society falling apart. And it'll fall towards a centralized bureaucracy like a totalitarian dictatorship or, a, you know, some sort of socialist Nazi regime. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> you just, uh... it, would be collecti it would be collectivism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of understand that. I, I think... I don't know. I just want to get back to your list of what the values are that we get from the Bible. I don't mean in a kind of facetious way. I just I, I, did, I didn't I didn't say we get values from the Bible. No, I. But you you said that there's some good you get from the Bible once you remove. All I the did woo. not say that. You said that. I said there are good Christian values. Oh, okay. I didn't mention the Bible. You okay. Did. Okay. All right. But the good. But one of the things you mentioned was compassion, and I just think that straight down the fairway conservative. Uh, why do I keep struggling with that word? Conservative. I wonder if that's my Alzheimer's. Hey, do you know about the draw a clock face? There, there are there are a few uh, a few syllables. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you know about the drawing a clock face uh, uh, test for Alzheimer's? Yes. Have you tried that? I have. How did you do? Badly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I keep passing. I keep drawing perfect clock faces. So um, I don't know what the hell's going on here. Anyway. Um, 
So conservatives, in my opinion, to be a staunch conservative means that compassion is just... Compassion outside of your own family, say, is not interesting to that person. It's anathema. Um, so maybe that's the box that's checked for compassion from the Bible. It's like compassion when it only applies to your own family. But what other good Christian values do you think a conservative? Well, the compassion is, I mean, the Christians are immensely charitable. I mean, they give more money to worthy causes than any other body in the world. Well, that's Christians, but I think conservatives probably don't. Uh, no, I thought we were talking about Christians. Oh, we, we're talking oh, about Christian oh, we values. Oh, f- yeah, I think that's sure. a Christian value. Okay, all right. Okay, fine. But I'm talking about how conservatives seem to embrace Judeo-Christian values, but without, in my opinion, actually reading any of the Bible at all. Because I said in my little intro, I about- don't necessarily think it has anything to do with the Bible. I think as America. This is why I said specifically Christian values. I think Christian values are not necessarily in line with the teachings you may find in the Bible. I think Christian values, because the Bible is so vague and it can be interpreted in so many millions of different ways uh, for different agendas, I think over time the working interpretation of biblical teachings can be found in general lay Christianity. And those values are what I think are more akin to the the philosophical outlook of conservatism, not specifically what you find in the Bible. You you know, I think most Christians probably haven't read the Bible, uh, but they do, they do participate in a Christian culture and they consider themselves to be Christianity. So that emergent effect from the Bible, that is Christianity in the United States is what I think American conservatism would want to defend. Okay, yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. But I think that's such a crazy huge chink in the armor of a conservative by pulling the Judeo-Christian card out. Because examine it. You know, you take it out of just face value. Because the thing I said in the intro about Jesus being conservative, it's like, what the hell is that all about? You know, what's that famous line? Something about a rich man getting into heaven, then a camel to travel through the eye of a needle, or whatever. And there's there's like hundreds of things like that in the Bible. On a, on a quick Google search about what's not conservative about Christianity in general, so it's like for a conservative to put that argument forward, it's like how can you not scrutinize that if you're on the other side of that argument? I don't know. I don't understand. That's something I just don't understand. Well, you're the believer, so you should probably tell me. <laughs> well, that's true. And as a believer, I'm saying I don't understand what the uh, what the what the line is that connects Christianity with conservatism. But another 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 mode of thinking with conservatives, it would appear, is this moral absolutism ah um, feature, which I think is peculiar. I mean, I've I've always struggled with any kind of objective morality. So moral absolutism means that rape is wrong always and forever in every way, anywhere. Whereas moral relativism is, well, you know, it depends. We we make up morality and morality is whatever we say it is. Uh, And that's, you know, there's quite a a chasm of uh, disagreement in thinking between those two ends of the spectrum. Um, so certainly I think American conservatives are moral absolutists. You know, they're, they're really, it it, it sort of points to a God. Uh, so it's easier to work from a, a mathematical point outwards. And that point is right and wrong. You know, they are facts. Uh, and they fear a creep towards moral relativism because they think, you know, if you become relative then you you are reintroducing the gladiatorial arenas and you're normalizing sickness and uh atrophy of society uh so i think i I think in defense of moral absolutism the conservative means well but i think fundamentally that totem is problematic so i don't support that yeah i mean i think that's just a failure of imagination if you just think about it, you can imagine a scenario where the most heinous acts could be 
like a, a valid action to stop something far worse happening. You know, like the torture argument, for example. It's like, what the hell? If you want to save a million people and you know someone who has the, you know, the code to deactivate the bomb, you know, all those sorts of thought experiments. I really don't understand that way of thinking. Well, that example there, I mean, again, it's open to interpretation. It depends how morally atomistic you want to get. Um, By killing one person to save a thousand people, it is morally reprehensible to kill that one person in isolation. But all things considered, it would be more morally repugnant not to save the thousand people. But again, you're into the world of metrics and uh, (laughs) it becomes really difficult really quickly to try and dig yourself out of that quandary. But uh, yes, the moral absolutism tract is an interesting one, uh, and I'm not quite sure exactly what the standing is throughout the various flavors of conservatism actually is. Uh, The freedom to choose one's own path to happiness. The whole freedom aspect, I think, is an important one. I think by freedom, what is meant by freedom is that you are able to do what you want to do with as little intervention from anyone else as possible. So, you know, you can really do whatever the hell you want to do unless you're adversely affecting the lives of other people, obviously. So you can expect to be judged and you can expect justice to be served by the larger group, depending on your actions. But if you're doing something that isn't bothering anybody, then you should be able to do that. That's a little bit murky as well in the conservative world because, you know, freedom to do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't bug anyone. That's a kind of a libertarian line. And it sounds like it's a conservative line, but they get real bent out of shape about legalizing marijuana and stuff like that and same-sex marriage and stuff that really wouldn't affect them. And it's like, well, what's that all about? Where does that argument come from? What's bugging you about that? I think, I mean, the same-sex marriage issue. Well, that's a Judeo-Christian that's, issue. Yeah, that, that's, that's a religious concern. That's a, that's a category the, error. The reason why that's repugnant is because uh, I think it's, it's contrary to the Christian experience in America. So, you know, that's, that's a step too far. But I, it, it's certainly something that people can come around to. It just, take, it just takes a while for that one to settle in. So that is antithetical to the freedom to choose one's own path to happiness if you have a problem with same-sex marriage. That flies right in that face. Uh, well, no, because, again, what, what is, that, that's a subset of the, uh, the belief of the rule of law. So that's pushing at the rule of law, the same-sex marriage thing, because you're changing the law in order to accommodate that. So that's an argument from a point in time where it's, it's illegal. I don't know. That's a weird one. So I guess you would then put the same argument forward about, well, would you, about legalizing marijuana? Because you're going to be legalizing it. So it'll be, it won't, won't be contrary to the rule of law. So why do they have a problem with that? I don't know. Do they have a problem with that? Yeah, they do. <laughs> this is part of the whole package deal thing. It's like, what the hell? Is it a package deal? Yeah. I mean, well, surely you can cherry pick out of these things. I'm sure there are there are non-religious American conservatives. No, it, it is. This is the thing about someone's view on climate change means you know what their view is about. Yeah, but remember, you're getting all of this information from the media. Well, that's who true. is, you know, absolutely not conservative in any way they're, they're left wingers so they're always trying to to show the darker side of I, I think that's true with the the general media but as i say i've been getting this stuff from the horses mouths by the likes of this ann coulter dennis prager and sean hannity who, names that you probably might not have heard of in the uk but their their views are often wheeled out at appropriate moments to hear the other side of the story also it's so unchristian how nasty these people are as well this ann coulter person So I put this little quote in here. Whether they are defending the Soviet Union or bleeding for Saddam Hussein, liberals are always against America. They are either traitors or idiots. And that's fairly tame for her. She's so nasty, this person. And she claims to to represent Judeo-Christian values. And me, as a Christian, I think a big part of being a Christian is to just be nice. Be Christian. Don't be an a-hole. She's she's really had it up to here 
she's really had lots of issues with uh, political correctness and um, American foreign policy and how the American government seems to want to defend the perpetrators rather than the victims and that the, the and that laws are are ignored she has a real problem with all of this uh you know she's she sounds fairly strident but i think she makes a lot of good points i mean i've heard her speak and i think you know that's entirely reasonable what she's saying and she's very popular you know she has a lot of power she has something like 10 best selling books and you know she's really 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 out there, really outspoken. Um, I think her latest book was called Adios America. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's funny. <laughs> how, how the American <laughs> society fabric is just being disintegrated. And that, you know, this is a real problem because, you know, what, what, what was the country that saved European countries from the nightmare of communism? Who was it? It was America. And it's not going to happen if, you know, the traditional values that are upheld currently uh disintegrate to the point where america has changed entirely and slid towards the left yeah i agree with some of that um it's interesting also just on the side point you just reminded me that ann coulter dennis Prager, all these people their kind of rhetoric is so self-righteous foreboding they're just fear-mongering all the time that's what they do that's that's exactly what the left do the left absolutely thrive on fear (laughs) they have to have it that's why they have these massive welfare programs which perpetuate the problem they have to have that problem they keep that problem going because that's where their votes are their votes come from that problem they want as many immigrants as they could possibly have they want as many people out of work as they possibly can have and they certainly want the biggest possible welfare budget they buy votes with their self-proposed generosity of course that generosity comes at the point of a gun when they take their taxes from the country as a whole so you know who are the fascists Mm, uh, interesting yeah so what's what's wrong with everyone well i think uh, i certainly support a more uh, you know an evolution towards a more voluntary state i think Uh, i definitely support smaller rather than larger government because all governments ever have always grown into extremely large behemoths that became incredibly corrupt and wasteful Uh, and and you know you don't want a large government you want a small agile government that is able to uphold the law support a police force defend the country and certainly defend the value of contracts Uh, and that's it all the rest of it no thank you uh, we can look after ourselves stop nannying me you know stop arresting me from for burning a quran and not arresting me for burning a bible uh, you know get out of the social melee and just defend the contracts you know stop poking your nose into absolutely every social um, consideration you can possibly find. Yeah, interesting. I think there is a maybe a new movement coming out of this because there's a couple of little facets of American conserv- conservatism which I agree with, but everything else, I just think they're a bunch of lunatics and just nasty people. Um, and the left are pretty much just as bad. So I'm, yeah, I'm, fi- if not I'm a lot finding worse. myself just sort of cherry picking out of each camp. And wish it, it just amazes me that people can think so differently. Uh, I've always found it amazing. I mean, you know, it's always a two-party system, you know, in any democracy you ever look at. And the reason why it's a two-party system is because there really are two schools of thought. And, and they're, they're radically different. And it, it all boils down for me, um, between, it boils down to the age-old argument between individualism and collectivism. It's, that's what it is. That's what it's all about. Uh, And you're going to take a side. And uh, it just seems incredibly difficult for anyone to think of some sort of hybrid. I think the closest anybody has to a hybrid system is in the UK, which is, you know, a very socialist informed capitalism. You know, it's it's free market. uh, And it's fairly, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of regulation, but the leaning is always towards further deregulation, albeit very slowly. Uh, but, you know, the, the socialism is there to prevent, you know, too much, uh, uh, too much of a divide between, you know, the, the wealthy and the poor. 
I think, uh, you know, keeping everybody is within the same spectrum, at least, is probably a good idea. Because when people become completely out of touch with their neighbors, then the real problems start. You know, you start on a whole dehumanization campaign. And you start to do crazy things like uh, Elon Musk wanting to send all the poor people to Mars. Oh, I've not heard that. Yep. True. True story. I was like, what are we going to do with all the poor people? Are we going to kill them all? No. But we can send them to Mars. Yes. Apparently uh, very cost-effectively, according to Mr. Musk. Really? Whose Tesla company has yet to make a profit. Yeah, but surely, like, the atmosphere on Mars, you know, they'll just die when they get off the spaceship. Well, you know, that's not Elon Musk's concern. He just needs to get them there. That, that's somebody else's problem. Oh, my God. Mars is the new Madagascar, where you know, the Nazis were going to transport all of the Jews to Madagascar. Which is a really large island, which suffers from island dwarfism. Oh, that's right. really weird. Yeah. All the animals are really tiny. Hmm. Versus the Galapagos, tiny, tiny islands, uh, really big animals. Yeah, giant turtles. So, Jeff, you're in the United Kingdom, and you are a Brit. You're a Brit. I am. Do you enjoy the BBC? Um, yes, but I only enjoy a very small part of the BBC. Right. It's a very large body of media, and I only really listen to Radio 4 occasionally, certainly not at 7 o'clock, and, and my go-to web page is BBC News. Oh, okay. Interesting. But would you say the BBC is part of that type of self-hating leftist propaganda? <laughs> I would say yes, but to a lesser extent, um, because it has a a government mandate, uh, and this is a sort of a logical mandate, which uh, tries to ensure that they're as neutral as possible. And I think that helps. It, it definitely helps. Whereas, you know, American publications just are absolutely hideously uh, leftish. I think I think the BBC is, but but to a lesser extent. What you have here in the United States is you have NPR, um, which is basically the BBC, very leftist, and it generally makes sense. You know, I certainly align more with the kinds of things that the the, the NPR talks about, and it's not quite as Western civilization is terrible. All other cultures are better, which is the general tone I get from the BBC. But here in the United States, you've got a lot of. AM radio stations that have like conservative talk shows. I think that's actually a genre where you get these yelling a holes just railing against everything. They just hate everything. I can't help but think that they're just playing a part. Um, I don't remember much of that in the UK. So that's the BBC. And do you read the Guardian, Jeff? No. Did you used to read the Guardian? Um, occasionally. Right. Back in the olden days when. There were newspapers, and there wasn't so much of the internet. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, newspapers. God, who'd have thought it? Huh. Yeah, that's true. Now I think uh, in my sort of RSS feed, I think occasionally an article will pop up. And I'll usually have a problem with it, because it'll probably be, as we have spoken about before, some asinine feminist non-issue. Oh, what like? And it'll just absolutely boil my blood. Oh, the the use of the female pronoun, stuff like that? <laughs> it'll, it'll be something like how incredibly intolerant and rape culture-y the UK is. <laughs> and yet the same person will, you know, say we it's important for us to respect, you know, other cultures like Islam. And it's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, th- th- that is a well-known um, argument that I'm hearing all the time sure there's all the a word now. for that argument. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just funny. This is what I mean about... So I align myself with a lot of values that are espoused. Is that the right word? Espoused by yes. the left. But there's stuff like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's so to- toxic to say things like... Okay, the UK, um, if you have a whole big group of people with extremely regressive views on women and just everything that we shouldn't tolerate, you know, their views on homosexuality and just a bunch of other things, and we have a whole bunch of them coming into the UK, are we allowed to be worried that the UK might not be as good with more people like that in it? It's like to say something like that, you are ostracized and likely to be killed. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, you know, anything is better than what we have now. You know, it, it, we, could, we could just uh, we could have a, an immigration policy where we only allow in mass murderers and still we would benefit from this. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's just crazy. It's there you just commit social suicide by saying, hey, "Hang on a minute." So the people coming into the UK, they are don't go there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's the thought police. I mean, it really is. You know, I can see a 1984-ish sort of uh, slimming down of the national lexicon, lest we upset, you know, some <laughs> minority group. Because uh, we've got so much to atone for, Jeff. Yeah, it's just, you know, I mean, you know, what do you do when you're 100% solid evil? I mean, there's no goodness that you can actually whittle down to. I uh, might as well just all go throw ourselves in the sea. But uh, another key hot topic that I think perhaps might highlight the uh, prevalence of conservative thought is abortion in the states so this is always an interesting topic that i always like to uh, listen to when any american politician either defends it or is against it uh, it certainly seems quite um binary uh, and I, I rarely hear anything of substance or anything even remotely rational on the subject but i think you're going to tell me that generally American conservatives are against it, uh, regardless. Is that true? Um, I would like Dennis Prager, for example. I, I've heard him say that canard about you know the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception. In fact, what he's no Bill O'Reilly. Um, I was listening to him, and he says we now have DNA evidence that the soul enters the zygote. <laughs> you know, just something stupid. This is what I mean about his uh, his pseudoscience that he brings out. So it seems to me that. The problem with abortion from the eyes of a conservative is purely religious. You're, you're, it's murder. So I can't remember what the arguments are. But yeah, I'd say, generally speaking, a conservative would be against abortion. So I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a religious motivation to uh, oppose abortion. I think, again, in the conservative spirit, it is let's not normalize it. I think any movement to acceptance is a movement towards normalization. And they they um, sort of uh, wilt in horror at the possibility that it would become just a standard procedure and there's no shame in it. There's no social taboo. It's virtually birth control. <laughs> I think that's sort of like a horror scenario of normalization for most American conservatives, I think. And they just want to push that away as, as far as they possibly can. And, you know, there are always tricky, problematic edge cases which they have to try and dance around, like uh, rape and, um, you know, uh, birth defects and uh, things like that. Incest and, uh, as well. Bit. Yeah, these, these, these are problematic. But I think generally the feeling is that we need to, if anything, this should become more shameful Um in, in, in the world of, uh, of uh, contraception. And it's just a massive, huge problem. Uh, but I don't think they're against... I mean, they are in, by implication, but they're not specifically against a woman's right to choose. They want female empowerment and equality. And this isn't a female empowerment issue, but I think the left promote it as a female empowerment issue and by its opposition they contest that the american conservatives are anti-women right which i think is uh ridiculously reductionist but it's a tricky topic i mean i don't know what goes through the mind of a pregnant lady who has to then decide to kill her fetus and all this kind of well thing. i mean when, when they say you know people are for abortion right the, le the people who are um, no nobody is for abortion. Nobody wants it to happen, right? It is horrifying. Obviously, nobody is for it. Yes, we should all have more abortion. Nobody is saying that. It is whether or not it should be handled in a medical way. That's the real issue really? because if you don't <laughs> legalize it if it's what it means is that if it isn't if you just say look we're making abortion illegal right it's illegal it is completely illegal do you do you think it's going to stop you've just made it illegal is it going to stop no it's going to continue but it's going to continue in an illegal way which is far more personally dangerous for everybody involved, right? So to just make it illegal, 
just makes it a hundred times harder for anybody who has it done, right? So um, I think Trump said this. Trump said something like, what did he say? He said... He properly flip-flopped on this. That's one of the big flip-flops that he just was like, I yeah, so... He was against he it. I think- he was against it. Now he's not. Oh, I mean, he was against, He was for legalize, illegalizing abortion, and now he's like, yeah. "Yeah, it's okay." Yeah, for exactly those reasons, I would imagine. I would hope. You know, actually, you know what? Holy cow! You know that's terrible. And it's like anything. You know, if you make anything illegal and it continues, it goes underground, and then God knows what happens. You know, that's not to say that's not to say work shouldn't be done to try and reduce the incidents. Uh, I think absolutely it should be. And I can confidently say that because I absolutely know nobody wants to do it, right? So, oh, so you're, you're mind vi- reading. Somebody can be, vi- well, no, it's a fact. Somebody could be absolutely horrifically violently raped, right? And impregnated. And they absolutely do not want to raise that baby, which is it could be you know entirely understandable. But they do not want to go through this procedure, right? They want to but they don't want to because it's horrendous. They don't so, want to, but they feel they have to. Exactly. So Precisely. this is, this is an aside, but this is kind of weird. So Poland have got a very powerful lobby for illegalizing abortion, like completely, totally illegal. No exceptions. Does that sound kind of crazy? Oh no. So I've remembered what Trump said. Didn't Trump say, didn't they, he was sort of ambushed on this, I think I feel. And they asked him, you know, should there be punishment? Oh, that's abortion. right. Yeah. And he said, yeah. And which is, which is a completely understandable reaction given his context, which is, I suppose, conservative in that there's a law, there's a transgressor. How, <laughs> what's the point in a law if there isn't a punishment? Of course, there should be a punishment. Yes. And that, and then he was, you know, he had his face. Yeah. There was at. a huge I mean, backlash. Yeah. There he was had a- the orange screamed off his face yeah. for this. The, he, there was a huge backlash. And then he, um, changed his his view on that, which strikes me as someone who isn't a great thinker. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, he he will have been advised, or perhaps he did a little bit of reading, or he just responded to the unbelievable amount of vitriol that was poured all over his head, and he thought, mm, tricky, tricky, tricky. So you know, I mean, you know, it's I, I, this is similar to some of his other arguments. Again, another conservative value, uh, law and action. Uh, the illegal Mexican immigrants, uh, they are all criminals. I think he said they're all criminals. No, he didn't even say they're all criminals. He said there's some nice, I'm sure there's some nice ones. They are all technical, technically criminals because, of course, they're illegal immigrants. They're illegal. They are criminals, all of them, without exception. And he says we should build a wall to stop them coming in. And again, the response was, oh, my God, that's outrageous. What do you mean that's outrageous? He wants to uphold the law. If you have a problem with the law, repeal the law. But if there is a law, defend it. I'm not sympathetic to his build a wall bluster. It's just insane because... Well, well obviously, for personal reasons. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yes, well, there's that. I don't want to be rounded up in the middle of the night, Jeff. No internment camps for you. <laughs> no, it's just that, you know, cr- there is a spectrum of criminal behavior, in my opinion, and the undocumented workers tend to be laborers that are just like working in a field or someone's nanny and all these kinds of things. And so when you lump all criminals in the same boat, you've got nannies and laborers and all this other stuff in the same boat as serial rapists and all this other thing. I think that's problematic. No, no, they're not the criminals, though. The criminal is Mexico. And Trump has said this. Mexico is the criminal because Mexico effectively, for all you know, all considerations uh, are sending people into the United States who then send money back to Mexico. And these are people, these are people who don't need to, who don't need to, um, who don't consume any resources or any services. And yet money is coming back from the United States. So that Mexico is leeching off the United States by not preventing. I mean, really, really strenuously not preventing Mexicans traveling to America. I mean, virtually advising them on how to do it, sort of not preventing them from going into America. And Trump is saying, we're going to, we're not only going to build a wall to prevent uh, illegal immigrants coming in, illegal immigration from Mexico, but we're also going to get the Mexican government to pay for it. And again, you know, just uh, whirlwinds of dissent and, 
and hate for this. I don't know. I don't get why you aren't condemning the man for some of this stuff. This is just insane. I, I condemn him for a lot of things, but that makes sense to me. That makes sense to you? So you're saying that him alleging that the Mexican government is culpable for Mexicans leaving Mexico, escaping to the United States, well, is reasonable? He, he believes that, the you know, obviously Mexicans are going to the United States because these Mexicans think the United States is more attractive than Mexico, right? So already that's through the fault of Mexico for not being more attractive. And also... Oh, well, come on, that's ridiculous. How is that ridiculous? That's just... Well, okay, well, first start, it's ridiculous because... These, these, these Mexicans are are committing a crime, and they right. know they're committing a crime. They're risking a lot through illegally emigrating, right? But what's the, what's the Mexican government got to do with that? And plus because also, the Mexican, what about this because talk the Mexican about, government does, doesn't do very much to stop this flow. Jeff, what's this talk about, we want a smaller government, but not for Mexico? We want their government to be so um, stifling and mollycoddling and in everyone's lives that no one has the freedom to skip over the border. <laughs> I didn't say any of that, but I think it's important that... It sounds like, yeah, we want a smaller... I'm not saying you, but say Trump, for example. I mean, yeah. I don't know what he said on the subject, but it's like, yeah, we want a smaller government, but Mexico, their government should be bigger and uh, keep everyone on a string. What? He didn't say anything of the sort. All he wants is not to have illegal immigration. That's all. There is a law that says no illegal immigration, he wants to uphold that law because what he's seeing is that law is worthless. That's what he's seeing. He's seeing all of these people coming in from this other country, undocumented workers, that are totally, utterly, and completely illegal and made illegal in a democracy. And he says, hey, guess what? We should probably look at that because it's as if the law doesn't even exist. That's what he wants to do. And he says... It's not fair that America pays this bill because it's up to Mexico to police their borders. You know, it's illegal for them. You know, it's, it's illegal in Mexico to come to another country illegally and to, to, to leave Mexico illegally is illegal, obviously. So I think it's completely reasonable that Trump wants to uphold the law. That is all. Upholding the law. Yeah, don't like the law? If you don't like the law and you don't have a problem with people coming over, just walking across the border into the United States from Mexico, don't have that? It's a democracy. Get rid of that law. Simple. Jeff, I just don't, I just don't understand. You and I will never see eye to eye on this. I can't get sympathetic with anything Trump says. Well, even that, even that example? Not really. I just think, so you it's, think just... it's okay that Mexicans come across the border into the United States illegally. I don't, I don't think it's okay. I just think there are bigger fish to fry. I mean, so we should just completely ignore the illegal Mexicans coming in. Uh, I just, it's again, it's just priorities. It's like, I just think, why don't we sort out some other problems closer to home? I mean, that's what pretty are close the to problems? home. People actually home invading. Okay, Jeff. No, really. I mean, you, you think that's a non-issue? I'm not smart enough to be able to think of a way out of this corner that you've got me in. Well, then why not just say, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, upholding the law and preventing illegal immigration. That's <sighs> entirely reasonable for you to say that. I don't, don't think need it to try is, and dodge, dodge, duck and weave like all the lefties. It's, it's because, I, I guess, with imagine, Trump... Imagine it wasn't Trump who said that. Imagine it was somebody else. If it was someone that I actually respected and didn't yeah. think was a total idiot, yeah. motivated by Ima his own imagine, narcissism. Imagine, imagine if the, uh, the Republican uh, nominee was Sam Harris, and he was saying, you know, <laughs> we, we should really make an effort to try and stop all of these illegal Mexicans coming into our country. You'd be well, first in line. No, no, no. Sam Harris would never you'd, you'd say be down that. At, you'd be down at the, the border yourself with an air rifle. <laughs> Oh, Jeff. I don't know. I, I, again, the w Republican just has the same kind of stink as conservative. It's like, by, by I couldn't possibly stand behind a Republican. Just well, it's just for politics. All it's the just the, pro the problem with politicians. I yeah, think I, just, I, I think so. But I think you I, have I think, to be corrupt to be a politician. By definition, I think you just have I, to be. I think, I think that's true. And I think a lot of people assume the worst when any politician, you know, is on the stage. But just to go to your point, it's Maybe if someone just, I agree that if someone who wasn't Trump said some of the things about border security, 
uh, immigration and all that kind of stuff, I'd probably give them a little bit more of my time. But I can't help it just with Trump. I just shut down. I just have such a low opinion of the man that I can't entertain anything he says. And that's a failing of mine, sure. I mean, I probably benefit from the fact that I have less exposure to Trump. Uh, so, you know, I rarely see him speak at length. He's not all over the media. Although he, he is, but he isn't. Uh, it doesn't get to my eyeballs quite so much as I can imagine he might were I to live in your country. So I think my opinion of him is not quite as low, but it's it's not high. <laughs> I, I, he frightens me in that he's so incoherent uh, with some of his outbursts. Yeah, and I just he think, really is. It's almost as if he can barely speak. And I think, yeah, wow, just... you know, you're actually going to elect this guy. And I thought George Bush was bad. But uh, in retrospect, I think, you know, actually he was one of the better presidents. Which, which George Bush? Uh, Junior. W. Oh, really? One of yeah. the better ones? Why'd you yeah. say that? I don't know. In retrospect, he seems to be, he seems to make more and more, <laughs> more and more sense to me. It is kind of, um, his sort of, uh, forward thinking, uh, uh, dealings with the Middle East. Uh, but anyway, I wasn't a fan. Uh, I was a fan of Reagan, though. I think uh, Ronald Reagan, now he was an American conservative. If anybody invented American conservatism, it could well have been him in the visage of the successful American conservative, and then before him, probably Nixon, um, who certainly was an American conservative as well. But Reagan, I think he was super successful because he ideologically defeated the biggest specter, the biggest bogeyman for conservatism in the United States, and that is communism. He defeated it, right, with his uh, mate with the um, the uh, little map of uh, Scandinavia on his head. Oh, Chernobyl. Yes, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chernobyl. <laughs> Gorbachev. <laughs> that's it, uh, that's it, that's it. Gorbachev and uh, Perestroika. Uh, but certainly yes. I think that was a major, major victory for yeah. conservatism in that the fall of the uh, Roman Empire. But what's interesting about that is I think y you can be um, not a firebrand leftist and have a certain respect for Reagan because the definitions have changed. It's like I, I, there is some point by point comparison between Reagan and like a modern conservative as in modern from our current era. And it's way different. It's like he was pretty liberal and he did a lot to raise awareness about um, global climate change. Reagan did. Yes. Um, again, I mean, climate change, I mean, it's one of those things where the, I, I don't have very many opinions on it, but just because there seems to be so much consensus on the human cause, I just, it's my, my skepticism reflex just kicks in and I just think, you know, there's so much agreement on this. What is the evidence exactly? And uh, is it such a bad thing? And, you know, come on. <laughs> Let's calm down a little bit. I'm not saying it's not a terrible, horrible thing. And, I don't and maybe know, we are right at the precipice and it's the end of the world because of it. But when dissenters are so ferociously attacked. You get suspicious. I, I get just a tad, just a tad suspicious. It's like that whole, um, you know, uh, uh, making... Uh, Holocaust denial, uh, a an offense. Oh yeah, well that and is I think, stupid. I think when you start doing that kind of thing, then you have to worry a little bit. I think it is certainly that freedom is a of speech slope. is important. This this insanity in political correctness has just gone mad. Um, I think you know all kinds of peculiar problems are going to start appearing like uh, this whole pansexual um you know all the the many gradations between male and female that are suddenly appearing and how you know we must be respectful of this because it is bona fide gender um definitions we're going to get to a place where people will be actually be suffering from some serious illness but they they won't be touched because that's who they are. You know, it's, it's the way they are. Um, to do anything would be to suggest that it's an ailment and not just a identification. And I'm always reminded by this case where a man was, he just couldn't live with his leg. He just couldn't stand it. It's just, oh, yeah. just, you know, didn't work for him and he had to have it removed. And, uh, he actually, you know, did have it removed. 
And then a while, and he was happy. And then a while later, he had some medication for some other problem. And um, he suddenly, the medication, you know, rebalanced his little um, fluids. And he thought, what the hell? Why did you cut my leg off? <laughs> what, what are you insane? I tell you to cut my leg off and you cut my leg off. Obviously, I was ill. I needed help. And here you are, you know, um, uh, helping along my uh, delusion. And yeah. that's the Fe- sort of feeding. That, that's the sort of problematic arena I think we're going to enter into once uh, absolutely every concession is made in every direction to every possible um, claim to identity. And uh, I just think it's a problem. I mean, I don't have a problem with whatever someone wants to be called. It's like, you know, fine, whatever. Um, I just have a problem where everyone's just getting a little too sensitive. Grow a thicker skin, everyone. Yeah, everybody's so easily offended. And Mm. again, you know, (laughs) I think when that happens, society and people deal with that, right? Uh, I think that is one of those things where if you just want to have a big, you you know, you want to wear a banana on your head all day and you're saying, you know, don't don't make fun of me because I'm I'll be unhappy uh, because of it. Uh, I'll be traumatized. Yeah. And you can go ahead and walk around with a banana on your head. Right. You're not going to get very far. It's not going to be long before you realize I just look like a complete arsehole and everybody can see that you're not wearing any clothes. But when the government gets behind you. And they start making it illegal to upset that person with a banana on their head. And then, you know, hello, blasphemy laws. Hello. You know, that's the slippery slope. I think conservatives want to slow down on slow down on this this social and cultural change. Let's not let's not jump ahead of ourselves here. Well, I'd certainly agree with that. And this is what I mean about there's now this void in the middle that people like you and I are in. And also, they're, they're, that's fine, because I think you and I, mostly me, are probably on the right side of a lot of these things. But then you get other crazy things happening, like the Trump phenomena. And also, you mentioned earlier, alt-right. What the oh, hell? Yes. And Breitbart. Oh, man. And Milo... Oh, that up idiot. Up, 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 up. Uh, I can't stand him. And I, actually, Sam Harris spoke about him recently, and I agreed with everything he said. Because he is... <laughs> well, no, because he... He really is just trolling the world. I was listening to him on a podcast, a Joe Rogan podcast, where he was... He's basically saying that the Christians are right about homosexuality, and it is... What does it say in the Bible about if a man... An abomination. It is an abomination. I he was gay, is he not? Yeah, gay? exactly. And this is what the podcaster like pointed out. And he goes, whoa, that's... You're self-hating. That's, <laughs> and, 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 that's and, very left-wing of you. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, no, no, I'm not self-hating. Um, he goes, well, you, you are. And it was a clear case where he's just like trolling. He's just like making this up. He's just ruffling feathers. It's just, I don't have time for people like that. Yeah. I think, I think one of the issues that he has, perhaps it's him or one of his colleagues, but one of the key issues he has is with the funding of people who are so easily offended. So he thinks, you know, if we didn't have such a welfare state, then you wouldn't get very far with the attitudes you're trying to level at people and you'd have to kind of, you know, integrate. And this is the, uh, this is the melting pot versus salad bowl analogy, which I found somewhere on the internet, meaning melting pot is preferable in that you have more social inclusion through assimilation and then Here salad in the United bowl, States. Yeah, and salad bowl is where you have enclaves. You know, you have your Chinatown and you have... The this. UK. Yes, and, and that's, that's the more multiculturalism tract. And I think, you know, I can see the pros and cons there, I think. You know, if you have different enclaves, you have a Chinatown and you have a little, little Poland... That's, Madrasses. That, that seems like it's culturally enriching because you can immerse yourselves more fully in those cultures. But it's also problematic when those cultures are at odds with each other, which often they are. And then, okay, you suddenly find yourself living in a multi-plural society. And sooner or later, you're going to have to have laws that reflects that. How do you build laws, as I mentioned earlier, when you have Sharia law and the Constitution? They are fundamentally incompatible. Yeah, but this is actually happening. This is why you have far more instances of radicalization in Western Europe than you do, say, in the United States, in my opinion. It's like here people are just Americans. Yeah, Americans. Americans. Because you have to have a job. 
You you are forced <laughs> to integrate. Well, that's not true. You, yeah, but you you're for, you're forced to integrate. You're forced to learn the language because you need to get a job. Whereas in countries that are far more left wing and more welfare and socialist oriented, um, you don't have to work. So you don't need to learn the language. You don't need to assimilate or integrate. And you just build your own little ghettos to start with. And then you build your own little states within states. And then that becomes a major problem, especially if you have significant population, because then you wield power. And then you start seriously destabilizing the host nation and the culture they're in. And this is, this can be seen in, you know, the Scandinavian, in Sweden, particularly, where, you know, such large numbers of sudden immigration of antithetical cultures are a real problem. Uh, and they it seemingly cannot be absorbed. Same with Germany, who Angela Merkel just insanely just said, "Hey, come on in, everybody." Yeah, well, that, that yeah, but that, that is complicated because you have. Well, that's the whole EU nightmare. No, no, but Germany, they need to be as ingratiating as they can to atone for that whole Nazi business. Yeah, which has exactly the opposite effect <laughs> because there are so many neo-Nazi groups. Uh, springing up everywhere but what doesn't help when you have that big huge rape epidemic in what was it what german cologne was it a couple oh, yeah. years ago yeah. that the media just wasn't going there so when you're yeah. not talking about these things what the hell does that make it 10 times worse when you can't talk about stuff like that i'm worried that we might have sort of uh, derailed ourselves a little bit going a little bit off topic there we're so sort of in the realm of what we're discussing in a broader sense i guess well it, well it's our our perception of what american conservatism is so i mean as a brit for me it is a a well reasoned and reasonable attitude towards how individuals should live with each other and operate in the united states at one end and then the far right religious lunatics at the other end i think it, it encompasses both sides of that and similarly, I mean, on the sort of left of center and democratic side, I can see the pros and cons there. I mean, you know, again, you have the total socialist, communist, um, Marxist, Leninist end um, in this country, fully embodied by Jeremy Corbyn. And then, you know, and then you have the more realistic, socially astute and caring politicians who simply don't want they want to reduce the amount of suffering and to reduce the enormous variation in wealth uh, and they think they can do that by implementing well thought out um social structures uh but it just always seems to need to have a huge government and i just think oh god no really uh, but then you can argue that the you know the Republicans and the more right wing would want a larger government as well, mostly just to uh, manage the sprawling military um, uh, wing uh, of government, which is uh, certainly immense in the United States. And I think Trump really wants to build up the uh, war machine and probably fund it from NATO contributions. See, that's something else that doesn't make sense. It's like they keep talking about the slippery slope of socialism. Or anything that's even slightly socialism leaning, because it's a slippery slope to Nazism. But what about building up your army, for Christ's sakes? How isn't that Nazi Germany? Well, I don't think it's or building up your military. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's Nazi Germany, but I think it certainly becomes a problem when you have that revolving door and what did they call it, the industrial military complex? Oh yeah. When you have your economy based on the success of the military. So this is the glazing company analogy whereby you sell windows, nobody wants your windows, you hire a young ragamuffin to go and smash the windows, and then you make some calls. <laughs> uh, so, you know, war is always an option when the economy starts going sour or you owe too much money. Uh, it's nice to be able to reset the counters and wipe the slate clean, and having a large, intimidating military that you can also sell um, is quite an asset. You know, keep certain regions destabilized, keep other regions um, nervous and jerky, and 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 keep keep your foot on the on the 
the wheel of power to uh, mangle some metaphors. Knowing that's the grand plan, how can you get behind that? It's like knowing that corruption and warmongering is so institutionalized in your uh, ideology. That just yeah, seems so unattractive it, to me. It does seem so unattractive, but there is no ideology where that, that is not the case. Certainly it is the case with the incumbent government. I mean, how many wars, how many invasions, how many drone strikes, how many destabilizing... Which incumbent toppled- government? Either, you mean? No, the, well, you, the you mean the American... Yeah, absolutely. Obama is the drone president. Oh, God, yeah. And Hillary, oh my God. She's <laughs> they didn't get me started on... Uh, and what she's been up to, uh, it, it boggles the mind. It really does. So I think this is just something that is just inherent in all governments in the United States. And it could be born of some sort of, just some sort of nervous anxiety with the rest of the world and how they're perceived by it. But uh, who knows? It's a bit more psychological. Um, have we hit all the topics? Is there anything else? No, I think we have. I think we've been at it now for long enough um, that we should probably uh, put a cap on it. We probably could have went more in, into detail, but if we could have, there's, a, things, there's a few topics there we didn't talk about, like the Heritage Foundation and Milton Friedman and William F. Buckley. But we'll put something in the notes. Um, I should just say that you have been listening to the Eclecticist podcast. You can find information on all of our shows, the show notes, and also a comment form if you'd like to send us uh, some suggestions or some advice at eclecticist.co.uk. Um, We don't know what we will be talking about next time, but it could be AI or it could be driving gloves. But if you do have any suggestions, uh, send us uh, a message on our webpage. Uh, That would be lovely. And until next time, we will be thinking of you. Thank you very much and good evening. (laughs) 